All right, welcome everyone. Again, this is a live virtual roundtable event where we'll discuss recruiting and retaining top technical talent. I'm your moderator, Kyle Whitney, partner at Halo Consulting, certified minority-owned search firm based in Chicago. Bring the process-oriented best practices our team developed at top executive search firms with a cost-conscious scrappiness you'd expect from a boutique or startup. Halo hosts monthly virtual roundtable events like this one or for HR and technology leaders on a variety of topics, and we look forward to seeing you at future Halo events. This event is being recorded, and feel free to drop any questions into the Q&A function, and we'll address those questions throughout the event. We'll be sharing a survey to gather your feedback, and we will post a recorded version of this event to YouTube. Today, we are joined by a great group of passionate talent acquisition leaders. We want this to be an interactive event, so please ask questions, and let's start off by just popping into the chat where you're tuning in from. Awesome. like to just put forward a couple of introductions here, starting with our today's panelists. First, I'd like to introduce Keenan Duncan. Keenan has 10 years of experience specific to technical recruiting across a wide range of organizations from contract recruiting agencies to enterprise SaaS giants like Microsoft and Amazon. He's recruited at various levels, including university graduates up to executive level positions. Currently, Keenan is a recruiting manager at the FinTech organization Dignify, heading up executive recruitment and technical recruiting strategy while ensuring diversity is at the forefront of all talent acquisition initiatives. Thanks for joining us, Keen. Our next panelist is Josh Kohler. Josh started his career in higher education as, and an, as an admissions counselor before transitioning into executive search over six years ago. In 2020, Josh made the transition to internal talent acquisition, joining Aurora, a startup focused on autonomous driving technologies. Josh has also recruited at various levels from C-suite executives down to entry-level software and hardware engineers. Really excited to have you here, Josh. Also joining us is Sean Raka. Sean has been in the talent acquisition space for over 12 years, having worked across internal teams and agency recruitment roles in various industries, including IT services, e-commerce platforms, and consumer packaged goods. Sean is now heading up the talent acquisition strategy at Go Health. Sean was responsible for establishing the sourcing function and a major contributor to tripling Go Health's employee count from 300 to 900 employees in a single year. Great to see you, Sean. Our final panelist joining us today is Anand Reddy. Anand has been in the talent acquisition space for around 12 to 13 years, with prior experience in talent recruitment platforms, agency recruiting, and tactical and software recruitment. Anand is now leading WP Engine's global talent team. They brought on 450 external hires last year globally the majority of those in software engineering, product management, and cloud and sales and support. Happy to have you, Anand. And without further ado, let's get started with our first question. Excuse me. Having had experience with organizations of various sizes and scale, what have you done to ensure diversity is always in the plan when hiring? What strategies would you recommend to other hiring leaders and recruiters? Keenan, why don't we start off with you? Sure. So uh, for this person, uh, for this question, it's really important to understand uh, what diversity is and not just, okay, we need to hire someone of color. That's not just what diversity is. We have diversity of military, uh, women, uh, sexuality. So there's a whole, di uh, whole, whole diversity of diversity that you can actually kind of uh, tap into. What I do first and what I think is the most important part is going to that hiring manager and trying to find out what they want in that job description and then going to more than just LinkedIn, um, going to um, different meetup.com, going to different um, areas in your, uh, in your uh, I'm trying to think of the word I'm looking for now, uh, trying to go to different um, pathways than just like I said, LinkedIn. So meetup.com or going to uh, some of the uh, university groups or going to um, Nesby, going to Grace Hopper. So there's always different ways to actually find um, and bring diversity to you, if that answers the question. Great response. Yeah. Yep, I'll, I'll agree with Keenan there. Um, obviously, uh, every organization has to, to decide where they're doing well on diversity, um, what, what demographics they need to improve on, uh, and what those jumps, you know, what your goals are from, from year to year. Um, we, we measured our 
diversity hires to our top of the funnel. And so they're equivalent, like what our top of the funnel is from our, our diversity demographics is very close to how many offers we make. And so if we want to improve that for us, it's it has to be a top of the funnel improvement. Um, and we've been taking different swings on that. Um, you know, uh, he mentioned some of the diversity partners that we've linked up with lately, Grace Hopper, uh, Blacks in Tech, Out in Tech. Um, and, and each one of those partners, you know, they're, they're not free, they're, they're expensive. So, you know, that, that's a, that's a consideration as well. Um, and then how you physically interact with their user base um, is another consideration too, though those platforms are all different. It's not as easy to message somebody on some of those as they are LinkedIn. So, um, you know, you, you have to take a look at the roles, the levels of roles you're hiring for, obviously at the entry level um, is a great way to do volume hiring for diversity and, and linking up with the universities and, and, uh, you know, let's be honest, there's more diversity coming into tech at 22 years old than there is at 45 years old. So that, that's another way to, to kind of go about it. Um, does every hire you make have to be a senior? Can we get more diverse by, by down leveling some roles, doing some volume hiring um, at the, the earlier in career roles? And then that diversity will permeate on up. Um, I'll stop there for now. And just uh, agreeing with what Anand just said, that's really, really important, not just kind of looking at, okay, we want to make sure that um, diversity is in our organization. So we're just going to do the higher level, going to the lower level, going to their entry level and doing that bulk recruiting that can actually really uh, bulk up your diversity. And also looking where else can we make a huge difference? So I appreciate him saying that. Yeah, and that helps you go outside of tech a little bit, right? And so you're bringing people into tech. If I if I go to Go Health and take one of Sean's female senior engineers, I just took an already marketable person from one tech company to another tech company. We're, we're not increasing the amount of diversity in tech. Um, so granted, we are, we're obviously going to fight over top talent at the senior levels, um, but but being open to folks potentially outside of tech is what, you know, what's a joke, like entry level tech role needs two years of tech experience, you know, so some, some of that kind of stuff hurts, hurts diversity. Yeah, I think here at Go Help, I think we, we started off our diversity mission by uh, ensuring we've got the right partnerships. Um, so internally, those partnerships were with our ERGs and our HR business partners and really making sure they're a part of the recruitment process and really helping sell the idea of how important diversity is within our organization. Um, and then it went into to tools because I, I didn't want to give my recruiters an edict to go out there and uh, expand our, our you know diverse internal or incoming application volume. Um, so we, we partnered with a company called Intello uh, to help our diversity sourcing uh, and a company called Diversity uh, with a C-I-T-Y, not an S-I-T-Y. Um, that have been great help to us. Um, and then the bright partnerships. So we we work really closely with with uh, companies like Skills for Chicago Land Future, Latinas in Tech, Black Tech Jobs that have been really helpful for us. So um, for me, it's not just telling your recruiters, go out and do it, but give them those internal, external resources and partnerships that are going to help them get what they need. Yeah, these are all really good points that I may be doubling down on or or potentially hopefully adding to but it it's partnerships and i think it's really important to both personally and sort of if you're a team leader remind your teams that they control the pipeline right uh it's partnerships pipeline and persistence where if if you build a pipeline that is sort of concomitantly diverse it is therefore more likely that you get a diverse hire, right? You're not going to find it if you don't look for it. And you have to be really dedicated and deliberate about finding that talent. I think the only thing that I haven't heard here that I'm, I'm sure everyone uh, has thought of or uh, has hopefully given credence to is some of this goes to the more passive candidate attraction strategies, where even job descriptions themselves should be built in such a way that encourages uh folks that are sort of on the fence, should I apply? Should I not? Hiring sort of inductively is inherently inclusive. Uh, so not being over prescriptive in some of those requirements can actually be really positive when it comes to trying to build a pipeline that, that reflects DE&I. Yeah. Josh, I think on that, we've, we've got a, uh, a disclaimer at the bottom of all of our job descriptions that, that calls out that it's historically uh, women and people of color don't apply to a job unless they check every single box, with, box within the responsibilities. And we encourage people to break that trend and apply. And, and we will, 
you know, consider and, and get you involved in the process. So that's been really helpful for us in, in expanding the, the pool. Great responses, guys. Moving on here. We've seen an increased consolidation in multiple companies conducting rifts and layoffs. How do you build strategies and messaging around engaging the market in bulk from a place of empathy and understanding? Josh, why don't you start us off on that one? Uh, I, not, not to feel singled out here, I actually volunteered this question because I come from a space in autonomous vehicles where uh, consolidation and rifts have been fairly rampant, uh, including one this week. Uh, but I do think that it's important to remember that we are dealing with human beings. And anytime there's a riff, I think the the natural recruiter response is, how can I benefit from this? Uh, where at the end of the day, sometimes taking a beat, being thoughtful, being strategic about how we engage talent, how the, the sort of outcomes of what is, quite frankly, most of the time devastating news for people on the receiving end, it, it sometimes is better to sort of go slow so you can go fast later. Um, and I think that that's something we've thought about quite a bit here at Aurora, where there are massive acquisitions. There was a very, very large player that that just essentially is being absorbed by uh, two larger companies. And it, it causes a lot of discomfort, but there's also, yes, we can spin this to our advantage, but should we be jumping right to what we believe to be the conclusion or should we be thoughtful and strategic about how to engage that talent? So building messaging at a one-to-one -one level that's really thoughtful, um, being strategic about what does this talent actually look like? Is it truly a one-to-one -one match? Just because they work in our industry, to borrow from an earlier point, just because someone is within tech or within our industry, maybe it's not the right sort of cultural fit or Maybe there's just a company values mismatch, but I think really taking stock of all of those things rather than living on layoffs.fyi, uh, not to plug any particular tool or, or denigrate it, but I think that it's really key nowadays because I think folks, especially in remote environments, are beginning to think more about how, how does my work matter and do I agree and exude the values of the company that I represent and I'm giving a third or more of my life to. Uh, I think being more thoughtful in that approach, I think has more value than not maybe that it used to, but I think it is a little bit more under the microscope than maybe it has felt to be in the past. And I agree. Um, and I'm, I might be slightly on the other side in that I do think, um, you know, my team does look at layoff lists often or companies that are going through issues and, you know, LinkedIn and other places have opened to work. And of course, there's all the, the Google Sheets and such. Um, but I, I do agree with Josh and being thoughtful that you're not um, carpet bombing or just spraying the larger laid off population, but somebody you reach out to. Well, I personally am not like a very soft and cuddly uh, messenger. I'll get to the point quickly. But where you can be thoughtful is not just be like, I heard you got laid off. Hey, I don't know if he got laid off. You know, obviously I read the news and you can say that in your message, but like, hey, I'm a recruiter. You know, I saw that there, there was some um, potential reduction in force at your company, but because of these key skill skips that you have, you would be a good fit for this role. Potentially we can talk about it. So I might not be so, I might not bring up the layoff in, in, in too many words, but I will be very specific or, and tell my recruiters to be very specific about what's attractive about that person besides the fact that they got laid off that makes them a good fit for your job and be, be ultra specific. And that'll appeal to them. Um, you know, they might not want to talk about the, ray, the layoff. They can be like, you saw it in the news. I saw it in the news. Everybody saw it in the news. Um, but tell me why I'm a fit for your company, not just that you know I'm available. I don't, I don't have much to add to that specific question, but kind of on the other side of it, um, Go Health, our, our company has gone through, uh, and, and maybe some recruiters here can sympathize, but we've had our own layoffs this year um, that, that we're, we've dealt with. Um, and as a, as a team, that means our messaging has to be different because we're still hiring. And so we're being honest about it and, and talking about what happened and how we're addressing it and how we hope to not go through it in the future because of some strategic changes that we've made. So I think it, it, it comes on to both sides, like that's been our struggle and, and just being honest and upfront of, hey, this happened, we're aware of it, 
but here's what we did to change and here's why we need people like you to do it. And just agreeing with what everyone just said, but I think the two main points that I kind of take away are being really honest about what's happening, but then also being very specific about, hey, the reason I'm targeting you, the reason I'm messaging you is for X, Y, and Z. When any recruiter sees that, any, um, any candidate sees that, they go, oh, okay, wow, they actually took time to actually look at what I'm doing. And that makes a huge difference because as you know, everyone on this call knows, um, we can get inundated with so many messages from all the different sites and you can see, oh, wow, they don't really even know what I do. And so when you actually are really specific, you don't even have to mention the layoff, uh, but you're saying, hey, being honest, going, hey, this is why I'm reaching out to you. And it just happens to be, oh, you just happen to be in a company that uh, lay the person off. So uh, being honest and being super specific of why you want that person makes all the difference in the world. Great context, guys. Thanks so much. Next question here. What is the most niche, tough to find technical skill set or position at your company? How do you go about recruiting individuals to fill that need? Sean, why don't you take the lead on this one? Sure. Um, a, a big spot where we've struggled internally here is, is hiring data engineers. Uh, it's one of the toughest fills in our organization um, and, uh, and often are, are getting poached and, and here in the Midwest by companies uh, on the West Coast, uh, paying West Coast salaries to Midwest employees to work remotely. And it's been quite difficult. So um, what we did was we, we took a strong look at the market and we understood you know, how the, how the comp has changed for that industry. But then we also started looking at the requirements that we needed for the role and realized that there was a, 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 an opportunity within an area where we hire very well at, at software engineers. Um, uh, and basically uh, went after software engineers who have a data specific background. Um, so uh, we worked closely with the managers to basically reframe the job description, reframe the requirements, but also knowing that this isn't necessarily a skill that you need day one, but you've got the basics of it in a different position that can help you be successful in it, knowing that we have a strong career development program. I think we lost Sean there real quick. Basically, kind of backing on uh, what Sean was just saying, uh, or adding on to what uh, Sean was just saying, uh, going and maybe re-leveling the job, also saying, okay, let's go talk to that hiring manager and find out, okay, do they need this from day one? Or are we going to help them learn around this? Um, when I was at Amazon, one of our um, hardest things to do was hire a software developer uh, level three is what they called it. And so what we had to do is, and what I did personally was, okay, let's look at the requirements and go, okay, cool. I can't find a lot because they're purple squirrel. They're very, very hard to find. So what I did was I went to the hiring manager. I said, okay, cool. I found you X, Y, and Z level three candidates, but maybe we can do a level two and you can actually um, help them grow in that way. So finding different ways to actually um, pinpoint the niche um, target of what you need by um, looking at the whole, looking holistically at the whole entire job. Can we redo the job description? Does it have to be at that level? And when you do those kind of things, it can um, make a huge difference. That's funny you say that, Keenan. I was an SDE3 recruiter at Amazon. It's like banging your, banging your head against the wall for a while. Um, we were just centralized and then we toss them to whoever, whoever wanted them. Anybody would want them after they officially get the, the role. Um, but also, you know, we'll let Sean jump back in here as he, he got it started. Um, but I agree with you on leveling, potentially evergreen racks, um, agnostic job descriptions, things like that. Yeah, I'm not sure where I got cut off, but, um, but yeah, I was basically saying kind of rethinking the position, but developing trust with your your engineering leaders to make sure that they're on board with the changes you want to make um, and to trying something different. So that was vitally important to us to get it done. And I'll extend upon the point. I, I'm sure plenty of recruiters uh, have have come through this loop, and sometimes the difficulty is with resistance from 
the the hiring manager, right? I need all of these things because I need all of these things. And I think where the conversation unpacks from there is not one that needs to be adversarial in nature, though it sometimes feels like it. Uh, what are the vitals? What do we need? And where are we willing, if able, to make trade-offs? And I think identifying really key points like, okay, if we accept that all of these things are necessary, what do we gain by waiting six, nine, 12 months to fill the role where an 80 or 90% match may be able to upskill quickly? A lot of a lot of the pushback that we receive, and this applies within my world of software engineers that live across the sort of hardware or bare metal divide, is that this team has too much of their own work to provide mentorship and guidance when a lot of times if you make a junior hire, it actually becomes a retention tool for the rest of the team, right? That enthusiasm, energy, if they have the right sort of attributes, attitude, that can solve for some of the aptitude. And a lot of times what these teams find is that can actually create more productivity and it's less time directly spent one-on-one -on -one, and it's more trust the environment that you've created to help folks rise to the occasion. And you have a longer runway with that, with that junior engineer that you, you hired. Um, for us, it is a cloud infrastructure slash DevOps engineers, especially in the US where the market's been super compressed and that they're making a lot of money. Um, and as a company that primarily cloud hosts, we have to hire a lot of them. Um, and we also need them in somewhat in the US time zone. So we can't rely as heavily on our, our European teams there. Um, but um, a lot of times Josh mentioned this, I need all this stuff because I need all this stuff. The frontline managers will not part with their, if they were granted an L4 role or senior staff, um, they want to keep that and they want to keep everything in there. Um, and sometimes the recruiter doesn't want to go around their back or doesn't have the relationship with, uh, you know, the VP of engineering for, for that um, level. And so they're going to just find what the, what the hiring manager wants. But we as recruiting leaders can go to that VP, like, how does your org look? Is it super top heavy? Um, you know, are all these skill sets really needed? And we found a lot of success there with like the VP of, of cloud engineering or platform engineering on our end being like, hey, open up the level two evergreen. I know all these people have three, um, you know, seniors and, and leads open, but like just run that evergreen through an agnostic interview process for good cloud engineers. And I'll, I'll start popping them onto these teams and telling them that like, hey, we'll keep looking for your three, but you're going to take this too. You know, like this person killed it. And so, um, you know, there, there's definitely executives and recruiting are way more on the same page than recruiting and frontline managers. For sure. Great insights, guys. Thanks. Moving on here. And, and speaking of, of, you know, different types of, of hiring managers, how do you drive buy-in from non-technical stakeholders for business critical, highly technical hires that perhaps require exceptions to compensation plans, flexible working, or other corporate policies? Josh, why don't you kick us off? I think a lot of that, I mean, show me a recruiter who's never gone above, above midpoint and I'll find you a liar. Um, but I think a lot of that rests upon building relationships of trust. And a lot of that comes with sort of showing the work, showing the data. Uh, fortunately, I we have spent a lot of time as of late building compensation bands that are considerate of market and reflective of individual situations. Uh, but there are more exceptions than there are things that apply to the rule, as is often the case. And I think that creating open lines of communication where you ultimately sort of are able to partner with folks where you're not just coming to them for exceptions, like set regular meetings with your business partners, set regular meetings with your compensation partners. Um, be thoughtful. If you if your company deploys things like sign-on bonuses that have sort of like an annual target, benchmark that, like show your work, and have your team even internal to recruiting collaborate and meet on these things regularly so that it's not, oh, hey, I need to grab five minutes on the compensation partner's calendar because they know exactly what I'm going to ask for and I know exactly how this conversation is going to go. Uh, all I don't know yet is the outcome, but I sure hope the answer is yes. So I would say 
build that relationship and make it a relationship of trust because we are bringing expertise to the table. We're, we're operating with the world's most difficult currency to trade, which is human beings and their wants, asks, and needs. So I think that it all goes back to relationships and being able to capitalize on those relationships so you can move quickly uh, when you are in that sort of negotiation process. And while I spent most of my time talking particularly around compensation, I think that there's plenty of other applications that uh, I'll let the rest of the panel speak to. I can jump in next. I think uh, uh, the way that we approach it, and I guess my my non-technical stakeholder is most often finance um, and and working with them. So uh, for us, it, it's it's about those, as Josh was saying, kind of partnerships, but that internal HR alignment is is what I find to be most important. So um, a strong partnership with my compensation uh, leader. So I, I have monthly one-to-ones with her where, where we sit down and discuss challenges that we're having and what, the, what she's seeing and, and how we can make adjustments as needed, um, but also have those same conversations bi-weekly with all the HR business partners that support our technology organization and others, but if we're talking technical talent. Um, uh, so uh, where I find the, the hurdle of finance is, is mostly easily overcome is, is if I'm going there with my compensation leader, my HR business partner, and myself with market data and, and uh not just the printed stuff that you get from a, a service, but um, uh, we know when we've got challenging roles that my recruiters are keeping us outside spreadsheet of everyone they've talked to, their experience, how much they're looking for, how much they're currently making, if we've got that, um, so that we've got real-time data along with the market data to support it, and then can typically get finance to give us a thumbs up. Yeah, we, we haven't done as many individual exceptions. I mean, we have a range and we have percentages that, that we're willing to go over um, midpoint that we, we can typically work between. Um, you know, what, what will come up with your compensation partner and your, your HRBP is why does this person need that exception and why aren't they the level up? Like, okay, great. They're, they're asking for 50% over the midpoint. Why aren't they a principal? Like, so what makes them right for this job, but not, a, but not right at principal? Why aren't they in the next higher band? And so we've been more flexible around looking at a skill set and being like, hey, the recruiters have all this data from people that they've talked to. The hiring managers and the departments have said, these are the right people and these are the right levels and all their salaries are correlated but they're not correlated to our bands. So we, maybe we need to shift the bands outside of what Radford says in, in this situation and because of this market. And so we've done that more than we've just done, okay, this person's great. We definitely feel like they're a senior, but they make way more than a different senior. Let's just pay them. Um, like for example, we did the cloud infrastructure DevOps engineers in Poland, and we were just getting our, our butts kicked, but all the candidates were asking for the same amount and they had all the right skills. So we shifted the whole band. We shifted the whole ladder more so than just making over and over individual um, exceptions. And honestly, just kind of going by what everyone said, I think it's, uh, it's really important to realize you need to always have that kind of good relationship with the conversation manager, with the hiring managers, make sure that everyone is gonna be on the same page and then um, and some of the scenarios that we just heard, um, is it going to be the skill set that needs to be different, that needs to be um, placed in a different band? Or can we actually just move the whole entire band over instead of doing that one to one um, comparison? So, as long as everyone uh, is flexible and trying to get everyone to be flexible is also uh, really important. <laughs> Great context, everyone. Going forward, how do you assess the performance of your hiring managers as interviewers? And what strategies would you recommend for setting up hiring managers for success in general? Uh, Sean, why don't you kick us off on that one? Yeah, um, for us, we, we focus really heavily on, on two things there. Um, uh, and I guess first is, is surveying. Um, so we use uh, Greenhouse. And if anyone on the, the call here uses Greenhouse, you you cannot change the surveys that they send out through the system. Um, there's 10 questions and everyone gets the same 10. Um, so we, we've we moved away from that. We use a tool called Starred that allows you to customize your surveys by different phases of when the candidate left the, the funnel. Um, 
and so we're surveying them throughout the process and, and we're also surveying our recruiters and we're surveying hiring managers so a lot of it's kind of survey data um so i i, I have all that information by hiring manager every time i sit down with my cto and we we analyze and we make sure that we're giving candidates the the right experience that they need um and then the and and that's very good data to have but i think when we start looking at funnel where where i measure my team top of the funnel making sure that you're being smart about who you speak to when the, when i look at the manager's performance in the hiring manager phone interviews and the interviews and the scorecards they're giving there's oftentimes a lot of trends that pop out of there you you can see the bias in in a manager when they're continually saying no to a particular you know, set of candidates. Um, and we watch that as well. So if, if we've got a manager who's talking to 10 people and only moving one to face to face stage, we know we've got an issue there. If we've got a candidate or a manager who keeps getting rejected offers, or candidates who keep dropping out of the, the interview process, we, we see the trend there and we can address it in real time. So for me, it's those two data points that make sure that we're, we're giving good experiences to candidates and getting the uh, acceptance rate that we need to, to fill positions. Sean's a little further along than us. Um, you know, that's definitely a direction that we would want to go in. We, we just switch ATSs to Workday. So we're, we're trying to wrap our heads around how to automate some of that, that surveying and measuring the ratios. Um, and oftentimes you might have the opposite problem. Like a hiring manager lets everybody through, but they're never passing the final interview. Like what, what so obviously that's not a decent point of failure uh, there as well. Um, you know, I know um, Keenan at Amazon, they had an algorithm, they measured everything uh, on hiring manager success, employee tenure, all of that. Um, I'd love to love to get there. Um, but at this point, we're a little bit more basic and just looking at the ratios of, of pass throughs to success, you know, offers um, to, to look that they're, they're closer to best practices. But um, being able to automate that is definitely something we're striving for. Which real, quick, on the, really uh, real quick on the training end we do train we do teach structured interviewing um and hope people adopt it and i think my move for 2023 is to not have ta do it because i feel like they think we have a vested interest in teaching this because it'll make more hires um and have a third party diversity consultant do it so that it's a little bit more independent and honestly kind of um going on what sean said i think what's really important is to look at those trends uh with those hiring managers who's getting through uh with the candidates who's not getting through uh or who is or are all the candidates getting through i think those are really really important because if you actually find what that trend is then you can kind of try and nip it in the bud before it gets too hard uh and past experience uh where i currently am at dignify I was seeing with um, one of my hiring managers, uh, it was for a product manager role. Um, she was saying no to absolutely everyone. Um, I gave her 20, 20 uh, candidates uh, and she said no. So I was like, okay, why are we saying no? It shouldn't have gotten in 20, but I was just like, I was focused on something. So, but it was like, why is she saying no? What's this trend that's happening up? Okay, it's because she wants this uh, one uh, particular, um, aspect of product manager that is nowhere on the job, um, the, the JD. So it's actually kind of find out what it is so you can try and nip in the butt as fast as possible. Yeah, and not a ton to add here, but I think that in the absence of automation or particular scale, or even like the, the wares uh, to navigate your ATS, uh, we use Greenhouse as well. And I think a lot of that reporting is, is sort of valuable when contextualized. I think it's always good practice to have that sort of, if you see something, say something. Like if you're identifying like bias within a particular round table, like if you hear something that is not something congruent with how we should be interviewing candidates, empower your recruiters to be able to say something. Hey, uh, if, if we don't want to see candidates from a particular company or a particular university, then we should curtail that type of behavior and make it sort of drive it back to the core competencies. And though it is a different route to the same end, I think that calling those things out in the moment is much easier than trying to sort of amalgamate them and charge up a bunch of resentment and then make a case that is done only with historical data. Um, so I think that it, it's sort of a, a joint solution, right? Like empower your recruiters to call things out, 
as they're happening and unfolding and allow them to flag things. But especially if you're in charge of leading an entire team or an entire organization, like stockpile that because there will come a time where if you're making a full business case, referencing the, that type of data is valuable. You take the words out of my mouth, Josh. The recruiter has to be taught um, if they if they you know are early in career on how to do that in real time. It's impossible later. One that you might have been able to save the candidate by getting it back on the rails in the moment. Two, the recruiter didn't tell me, and then I go talk to that person's manager, and it's this game of tattletale. And then now the recruiter and the hire manager against each other. Um, but you have to be able to tastefully do it in real time. Love the responses there. Going forward, a bit of a shorter question. How do you conduct technical assessments? What advice do you have for other companies? And uh, Anand, we'll, we'll kick off with your thoughts. We've, we've definitely had a lot of trial and error on this one. Um, we used to do a sales assessment that was take home automatically graded for the right sales DNA so we could hire outside of software to, to widen our net. And then the other big assessment that we used to do was a take home project for our software engineers to code. And that went over really well, especially for senior principal engineers. They didn't, what they were saying anecdotally was they didn't love to, to do an automated graded something like a hacker rank. And they didn't like to do, they didn't love the live code uh, where somebody's watching them over their shoulder that they, they wanted to do this where they could do 30 minutes, pick it up for another 30 minutes, get it back to us in a few days where the assessments went sideways for us uh, during the great resignation and one of the tightest labor markets, you know, in the, in the last 20 years is people are like, send down the assessment. Nobody would complete it. You know, we're getting like a 20, 30% completion percentage on the assessments. And, of, and then of course there's like a failure rate, right? So now top of funnel is super, super low. Um, so we had to pivot. And so for the sales, we dropped the assessment. Uh, we did some additional sales training on, um, internally so people can do better at the, the standard interview process and not lean on the assessment. And then for engineering, we, we went out and got a vendor coder pad slash coding game um, to do and created a custom auto graded test. And then also we have the live grading platform and we still have the take home test. And so we explained to hiring managers the pros and cons of each one and that they can do the take home test, but they might get a low completion percentage or it's gonna slow down the pipeline because people are gonna take two weeks to do it. Um, whereas people, candidates might groan about the live code, but we have 100% attendance to it and then it's just out of the way. Um, and then once the hiring manager pick ones, picks one, they have to use that for the life cycle of the rec. They, they can't switch it up for different candidates. Uh, but when they open up a new rec, they can try something else. It's funny that you mentioned hacker rank. We we demoed them and my uh, VP of engineering said no to them because uh, he was like, we our data needs to be secure and we can't use something that has the word hacker in it. <laughs> Um, but we've struggled here with getting uh, people to complete our assessments. We have proprietary ones that have been developed in-house. Um, the challenge we face is uh, they get shared, you know, and, and, and you can't fully trust that the, the person you want to take the test is actually doing it. Um, and similarly, we ran into issues of people, uh, low completion rates. So we would typically send out the, the test right after the uh, recruiter phone screen. Um, and as the labor market got tighter, that response rate got lower and lower. Uh, so we, we, we pushed it after uh, a hiring manager screen uh, where really the, the, the entire point and, and the focus of that manager screen was you're not there to assess them technically, you are, you are selling why they should wanna work here. Um, so you know there would be some light interview questions, but really it was there to get them engaged in the process so that they would actually do the assessment after that. So. Just toying with the process a little bit has has seen some success for us, uh, as well as making sure the candidates feel welcomed and and really engaged by by who we are, so that they want to do it. Real quick, Sean, um, ours is proprietary too, and it's what you would probably call more of a project than questions. But at their final interview, what used to be an onsite, they have to talk about the decisions that they made, and they 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 op they take out the project and like, well, walk me through why you did this. So that yeah. will help some of the the fraud. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Bring it back. <laughs> I like that. I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I think that driving consistency through the process is a good theme here uh, because ultimately what you're looking to do, none of us, or at least myself, I'll speak for myself. 
I've never written a line of code in my life. So when it comes to assessing technical talent, I'm going to have to rely on the engineering team to do that on my behalf. Uh, we use CoderPad asynchronous assessments. Uh, rare are the scenarios where we are willing to sort of create an exemption and do a take-home test. Uh, but I think what is key in that synchronous environment is uh, we encourage all of our recruiters to do pre-interview huddles uh, synchronously with the entire team. So it's clear who is asking what to gather what signal and that the questions, especially those technical and coding questions are well benchmarked. Like this is what performance looks like for someone who is a yes versus a strong yes versus a no. And then even as a subset of that, this is what good performance looks like for someone of a given level. Uh, because more often than not, uh, we can't just go on vibes. Uh, and it's usually not a good way to scale a company if you're just like, I like this person. They seem nice. Uh, while that's a good thing, uh, it's not necessarily defensible. Uh, so I think for us, it has been an exercise of benchmarking, providing the right frameworks, uh, being sort of more present throughout the process, not just when it's like prime time and the candidate is interviewing, but before in a sort of pre-interview huddle. And then we also run 30 minute roundtables with the entire panel where scorecards need to be submitted. We dig into the feedback around those scorecards. It also creates sort of a set of artifacts so that you can help identify those trends from the previous question. Quick one. So if you are creating a proprietary test or you have a coder pad or hacker rank, you can write custom questions. Um, we also used a diverse subset of software engineers to create those custom tests. Um, you know, they they definitely had opinions and they thought some of the out of the box tests would would favor for your computer science degrees, algorithm heavy, and you know, it got into what the, the demographics of for your computer science degrees are versus like what we need people coming out of boot camps um, and all and other aspects of how the the test in a weird way could filter for lack of diversity if it was you know kind of based off certain standards. And any other thoughts? These are all great responses. Excuse me, move forward here. Another long one for us. How do you balance informing potential candidates about appealing product work versus the administrative functional responsibilities that comprise every technical role? For example, you may be recruiting someone to build a new product functionality that has a direct impact for the customer, but it may involve overcoming a severe amount of tech debt. Uh, Josh, what have you found to be successful in those situations? I think this is the unfortunate reality that a lot of us have to tangle with when you finally do have a candidate on the hook uh, to close, right? Uh, sometimes we all have to peel potatoes, uh, and I think communicating the reality of a role, uh, is incumbent partially upon recruiter, but also requires you to have that relationship of trust with your hiring manager and have a deep understanding at the recruiter level of these are the sort of opportunities that the role presents, but we all have to sort of ante up and solve technical debt from time to time. So I think candidates for whatever set of skills they have, a lot of candidates have a really good meter around BS. So being able to be realistic and genuine is always better than sort of painting a picture that may not be congruent with reality. So my advice there is to just be consistent and be honest because at the end of the day, the upshot and the long-term opportunity of the role, trusting the sort of environment and culture that your company has created and the alignment of those values makes it easier for folks to lean in and solve things that may not be uh, the sort of uh, sexiest sort of high curb appeal type projects, so to speak. Going off what Josh just said, one thing that I think is really important is to have that hiring manager um, honestly do a sales call with that candidate. So, hey, okay, cool. 
uh, hiring manager, I have this candidate. You already interviewed them, you like them, but they're asking all these real technical questions and go, okay, cool. I need you now to back on and do a sales call with them. Tell them what exactly they're gonna be doing, why they're gonna be doing this. And I think it happens when you have that um, kind of relationship with the hiring manager, the candidate can actually see it, that you can actually get on uh, the call with the hiring manager and the candidate and go, cool. Now can, I'm passing you back to the hiring manager so you guys can talk about that technical side in more depth. And when that happens, the candidate goes, oh, wow, this is a collaborative group. And when that happens, it makes a huge, uh, a huge impact in the candidate's mind go, hey, this is probably where I wanna work. So that technical debt, um, it can be overcome that way. It still is there, still needs to be done, but you are now showing the candidate what is, I think really important to them is, okay, this company actually works together and it's not just gonna be all siloed. Agreed on, on all that. The, I mean, and the candidate's gonna talk to maybe two, three, four other interviewers too, um, who might not have been at the intake call and they don't show up till some later point there. So having the hiring manager help you create that pitch of what's exciting about this role. So the recruiter can pitch it from day one hiring manager can pitch it throughout and make sure the team knows that well, like it, it's the same message as well. Like they don't want to, you don't want the candidate to uncover something that they thought the recruiter and the hiring manager hid, but one of their peers is like, oh yeah, we're, we're pounding through all this tech debt. Like it, it should be the, you know, a, a focused and accurate message throughout. Yeah, I would say the only thing that I can add to that conversation, I suppose, is is the uh, the alignment that, that Anand was mentioning there. Like, uh, what we do before we get to interviews at any point is is have a bit of like an FAQ doc that goes out to everyone on the interview team uh, that really defines what the role is going to be, uh, making sure we're aligned on what's good for a candidate, um, and uh, also what they should expect in the job. So if there is technical debt, then it's going to be addressed at every phase during the interview. Um, and not going to be something that we gloss over. Uh, it's going to be something we address head on and just are honest about. Great points. Uh, we did get a, a question from the audience kind of offshooting from this topic. What do you do as an organization outside of compensation and flexing on schedules slash working remote to make your engineering or cyber or data science teams happy and keep them from leaving? Any unique perks or culture attributes? We just hire them, right? I'm kidding. But, um, you know, slightly slightly different teams that we we come for. But on our end, but to piggyback off the last question, sorry, I'm at an airport, y'all. Um, <laughs> um, but to piggyback off the last question, I think if we can be very honest about the work, what they're working on, what the work-life balance is like, um, and anything else about the day-to-day -day during the recruiting process, they're not thrown off by when they get here. If you promise somebody the world, hey, this is a lifestyle job, you won't be working hard, or whatever the case is, you'll get a raise every six months just to close the deal. That's a bad deal. That's a bad way of recruiting. And that, you know, that's going to get your HRBPs and your hiring managers, and you're going to be working on nothing but backfills. Um, and, and that stuff will snowball. So from a recruiting standpoint, I would like to put the most accurate description of what their, you know, 30, 60, 90 year is going to be, even if it's not super rosy, uh, at least people who, you know, accept your interview process and offer, they have all the info in front of them. And to to piggyback on that, I think perks are perks. And honestly, it's sort of a zero sum game. It's I look at it like I look at what used to be the college admissions process. One, one college put a rock wall in its gym and then suddenly everybody had a rock wall in their gym and they had these really luxurious dorms, right? That's an arms race that nobody will ever win in any kind of meaningful way. I think what this comes down to in terms of talent attraction and retention is mission match, right? If if you can find someone who's truly passionate about the problem that you are solving and the way that your company has chosen to solve it with the, the type of mindset that employs that, that's where you're going to be able to not just onboard, but retain that talent, which then becomes a magnet for more talent of that type. That's funny. We did a we we surveyed our internal engineers and and did an external survey uh, through our CRM 
to ask what what matters most to people and and the things you mentioned that you know people want money and they want flexibility uh like really like nobody we were like what sort of perks are interesting to you and everyone was like we don't want free haircuts we don't want games in the office we don't want to go to the office we just want to do our job and get paid well for it so um wherever we want to do it so you know for us i don't, I don't have a great answer for you um because i i don't see our technical talent really caring about that stuff anymore great responses honesty transparency drives the market and everybody likes money and flexibility <laughs> um so that actually also ties into a last question and and you know going back to your joke on on you know we just hired them right um ghosting is common in the modern working environment employees or new hires simply stop showing up or miss their start dates has this been an issue for your organization and what strategies do you employ to avoid or prevent it? Very similar to the last question, just a little bit earlier in timeline. Yeah, so we, we haven't run in um, too much to like the, the no call, no show, like where they, they didn't just show up on the first day um, or, or even leaving very early um, on the job either. But in that tight labor market, more so, you know, eight, nine, 10, 12 months ago, we were losing a lot of people between offer signed and start date. It, it wasn't total ghost. You know, they would let us know that a, another third offer came way over the top or a counter offer from the current company. And it was just too much money that they couldn't pass us up. And they had every intention of joining us, but you know, 30, 40, 50% more money, um, which I, which I totally get. And I don't think we're going to save those people no matter what we were doing, but there might be other situations that are in that 10 to 15, 5, 10, 15% um, that the second that person signs, you know, the hiring team is, you know, emailing them, congrats, so glad interviewing you, glad you joined. You know, there's LinkedIn requests. If, if you're in the same area, you can meet up with that person, bring them out to a happy hour, bring them out to the office before their start date, but making them feel like part of the team. So there's a lot of faces that they've put equity in with. Um, and obviously they, they have pride and they have a reputation that, hey, even though this other offers five or 10 grand more, you know, I've met some solid people here and I'm not going to turn my back on them there. But if it's just like they sign the offer and the only person they know is like the recruiter, you know, they can just be like, I'm just going to take this 10K. I don't even really know anybody there, you know, and the start date's not for another three weeks. They'll figure it out. Um, so, you know, it, it's really trying to create, you know, make them feel like an employee, even though there's going to be some lag time between offer and set start date. Yeah, I think that, that yeah, also our, calls our, out. Um, I think that also calls out to sort of assumptions, but also reflexive things we can do well. Start onboarding immediately, right? Partner with the sort of organizations and people to make sure that there are more points of contact. Guilt can be a powerful tool uh, when it comes to rethinking things or finishing out processes. Uh, so get those introductions moving, get the swag bag in the mail. That's always helpful. But I think also trying to keep those start dates realistic and tight. Um, obviously there's a set of due diligence that goes into, do you expect a counter offer? Do you have other processes running? We know that data. So let's make sure if they tell us that they're shutting down the dance, that the dance is truly shut down, but make it real because that, especially in a remote environment, that personal connection may not exist. Uh, we have a lot of candidates where, uh, we use this more as a closing mechanism, but I, I can see it being employed as sort of a onboarding slash retention tool too, like bring them in for lunch uh, if your company has lunch or have them meet someone off the books before they start. There's a lot of different sort of human elements to this that I feel like we have uh, potentially forgotten or gotten away from with COVID, but insofar as it makes sense and it's reasonable for your company, I think that having those human elements is what creates those connections. Kenan, sound like you and, well, well, I mean, I was just going to honestly agree with what uh, they both just said, but is that humanity aspect that needs to not be lost. It is um, definitely onboarding right away. But what I um, do and what I've had my recruiters do is, okay, just because you hired them, you're not done with them yet. Like contact them going, hey, I'm really excited for you to join. Maybe once or twice uh, and that whole entire time period before they actually start. 
just so they go, okay, cool. That recruiter isn't just going to uh, abandon me now. Cause like, maybe that's the only person I know, but onboarding that swag back, but that humanity aspect is so, and so important is bring them into the fold. Because if you bring them into the fold, then it's going to be easier for uh, them to want to stay if they have like 10, 15% more. And maybe, I don't know, you can re, uh, renegotiate, but also what Anon, uh, Anon said is that whole entire, um, if it's like 30, 40% more, you weren't going to keep them anyway. They were literally just there. Hey, I found a job. Now I'm going to continue to still uh, interview. So don't really worry about those people. Worry about um, the people that you can control and you can control them by not losing that humanity. Great responses. I think we got we got time for one more question here, also from the audience. Um, do you make your TA teams do any technical training or research? How do you help them speak the language, especially junior recruiters? This is a great one for a lot of us agency folks out there. I was thinking of it uh, as, as non-agency person, um, the junior recruiters and people that I'm I guess every, most recruiters on my team who are non-technical um, want to move over to tech ultimately, right? So um, a, a part of their kind of development and, and growth plans are to, to shadow. Um, so we, you know, we, we've got a great relationship with our engineering leadership team and they will let recruiters sit in on interviews, listen to them, ask questions, talk about things, um, just listening uh, is is really important um and the second thing again kind of leaning on our engineering leadership um they've got it they've built us a talk track and and walk us through every phase of of our tech stack and what that means and how it works together so that we're ready to do it so we've got a bit of a cheat sheet that we use when we're talking about a specific position we've got it already there in front of us we might not know what we're saying you know but we're we're saying the words and also honest with the candidate like I know enough to be dangerous, but I don't, I can't do the work. Yeah, same. I mean, some people like me will just do an end up intake call. And then I'm like, but why, but why, what does that do? How does that get to the customer and, and do it myself? But I've had other recruiters that like classroom style stuff. And if you have the budget, you know, you can send them to a LinkedIn learning or, or even like a third party course. They, they have some really good technical, uh, technical training um, webinars or, and some are even in person if you want to go down the, the paid route. Um, but a lot of it is like, how well do you set up your intake? Are you asking the right questions? Are you asking the next level of question? Um, and then learn everything about that role. And then obviously have a good company elevator pitch, but like, don't try to show off on the, on the recruiter screen. Let the other guy talk, let, let the other person talk. Like, yeah, you want to be able to speak to the role, um, but you don't have to, you know, explain how the whole company's built. Like let them do the talking and uh, um, you'll, you'll learn over time as you do more screens and stuff like that. And so that, that's how I came up, but I do understand some people like a little bit more formalized training and we do lean on our engineering department for that as well to, to help us. I think you should lean on the engineering department. What I've done, um, I've used uh, the technology of actually use TikTok a lot. And what I mean by that is going, hey, okay, so we have this brand new magical tool of TikTok. Uh, and there's so many different corners that you can go into it about recruiting, HR, uh, tech recruiting. And so I will actually send uh, my recruiters I have in the past of certain TikToks to look at because guess what? That will then affect the algorithm and they'll see it and they'll learn through osmosis. But there's also GitHub, there's also Stack Overflow, there's LinkedIn Learning, there's so many different ways. And also pair them with a more senior recruiter, have them sit with engineering, just like everyone else has said. So there's multiple ways for that junior recruiter to be able to really, really grow. But I think what's also really important is uh, what Anand said is we're not the one doing Success the talking. Success takes sacrifice. Need You'll need to come. Yeah, that was weird. Uh, we are um, needing the candidate to speak. Um, and if we actually know at least a little bit, I, I think we all kind of know this, um, the saying, um, our knowledge is an inch deep and a mile wide. And so basically, let me know, I, I, let, me, let the uh, junior recruiter and you be aware, hey, we don't need to know everything, but we need to make sure that our BS meter is functioning correctly, especially when doing tech, so.
Awesome points, guys. And it looks like we're a little bit short on time. So I'd like to give a very special thank you to all of our panelists today for such a rich discussion. Scan their QR code to connect with them on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also you know, compliment shaving tactics as well as beard growth styles. Uh, got some, <laughs> some strong Aberlite stuff going on right now. Um, and, and in addition to that, also like us to uh, just generally check out our YouTube channel at Halo for past events, including the Halo series where we feature thought leaders in a one-to-one -one setting as they discuss what is keeping them up at night. Thank you to everyone that attended. We will have a version uploaded to YouTube very shortly. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks again to our panelists as well. Bye, all. Bye, all. See you all. Bye.